Have you ever prayed for your grandchildren? And I'm, not mean, I'm not talking about those who already have grandchildren. <laughs> That's what we just did. When our children said, the Lord will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. Your children's descendants. <laughs> That's what they just prophesied about. The Lord will do it that you might live. I, I'm not ready to think about my grandchildren <laughs> yet. But... Um, the Lord has promised that for us. He's gone ahead of us. You know who that promise is for? Let's look at it very quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 30. <clears throat> the, the verse actually begins with the word moreover. Moreover. And uh, for children who don't, understand what that word means moreover means on top of everything god has already done he'll do even more more over like how you would ask for them to slap on the ice cream put on a extra helping on the third scoop that's how god wants to do this promise moreover on top of all he has already done but that means we have to go back and look at the previous verses. I was really blessed meditating on this verse that it's a promise for those who have failed. It's a promise for those who heard the command, received the instruction, and blew it. Deuteronomy 30 verse 1. So it shall be when all of these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you and you call them to mind in all nations where the Lord your God has banished you. In other words, you're under the punishment of the Lord because of sin. And then you return to the Lord your God and you obey him with all your heart and soul according to all that I command you today, you and your children. Then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity. He's already saying, I mean, they're, they're, they're out of captivity. What is he telling the Israelites in Deuteronomy 30? He says, I set you free from the Egyptians. Now you're going to go and lend, in this land, and I already know you're going to disobey. I already know it, the Lord's saying. But if down the road, thousands of years from now, if you will turn to me, if your descendants will turn to me, I'll hear. And I'll restore you from your captivity. I will uh, restore you from captivity, he says in verse 3. And I'll have compassion on you. And will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are at the ends of the earth. From there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you back. The Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. And he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. What a promise. Amen. Who said the Old Testament is heavy? <laughs> it's not. When we understand the newness of life in Christ that makes it all real. And a book like Deuteronomy, I was always challenged by the fact that when Jesus was tempted by the devil, he quoted out of the same book every time. Deuteronomy. <laughs> it's a book very, people, very few people know well. But Jesus quoted it, and he overcame the devil by quoting Deuteronomy. Um, yeah, I have a burden from the Lord I thought I would share with you all this morning. Um, and that is regarding the, um, I thought I would speak on the journey that the Israelites went on when they came out of Egypt. Maybe we can begin with this verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 10.
1 Corinthians chapter 10 it begins in verse 1 by saying, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren. And if God, through the Holy Spirit, says, I don't want you to be unaware, it's almost like he says, I have a feeling you will be unaware. That our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased. Or you can say God was displeased. For they were laid low in the wilderness. And then he says in verse 6, Now these things, and that's why he's saying, I don't want you to be unaware, that the whole point of that, all the Old Testament... These things happened as examples for us so that we would not make the same mistake that they made. You know, I've heard a saying that goes something like this. uh, I might have to interpret it. That a foolish man does not learn from his own mistakes. A sensible person learns from his mistakes. But a wise person learns from the mistakes of others. So you see somebody make a mistake or do something and you see how it ended up with them and you say, I don't want to make that same mistake. I don't have to do the same thing that they did and then realize, oh yeah, you do the same thing, the same thing's going to happen. And that's what he's saying here. These things happened as an example for us. And in Hebrews, or maybe later on in this chapter, it says, upon whom the ends of the ages has come. I think that's in Hebrews 10. These things happened as examples for us so that we would not make the same mistake that they did. I would like to encourage us as believers, as disciples of Jesus Christ, to meditate often on the history of Israel. Because we're given that instruction. I don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters. To meditate often on the mistakes that they made. And I was even thinking this morning, as I was meditating on this, that When we tell our children the Bible stories, is it just because, you know, God was judging the world that he sent the flood? Yeah, that's true. That's the Genesis 6 version of it. The 1 Corinthians 10 verse 6 version of the flood is, the whole point of that flood was for you today in 2022. And so when we teach our children these stories about the flood and the kings of Israel and Judah, uh, the captivity in Egypt and uh, the plagues, their journey into the promised land, all those things that you read in the Old Testament, it's not just a fun story. Now maybe it is for the children, but I encourage us as parents, even as you share those stories with the children, to try to share with them There's an implication, there's a meaning for us today in 2022. These things, the flood, creation, you could go on listing all of those things from Genesis to Malachi. These things happened as an example for us so that we would learn the lesson. And it's almost like in a a school where your teacher gives you, says, hey, listen, on the exam, they're going to ask you this portion of scripture make sure you know this this part of the text really well because you they're going to ask it that's a guaranteed question here's a guaranteed question we're going to get at the end of the lives uh, of our lives did you learn from the lesson of israel i hope we are learning from the lesson of israel <clears throat> and um so just thinking about that journey from <clears throat> Uh, where Israel began. For 430 years, Israel was in captivity in Egypt. That was a long period of time. And that's a picture of our bondage in sin. We sang about that. Freedom, glorious freedom. Christ has set us free. So for 430 years, the people of Israel, who were already the chosen people of God, were bound in sin. And that is a picture of us Bound in sin. Um, Before I go on, I want you to see this verse. I'd like you to see this verse with me in Titus chapter 2. Verse 
what makes it possible for us to learn the lesson from the Israelites, because they themselves didn't learn the lesson. They kept making the same mistake over and over again. Our Bible reading uh, recently was in the book of Judges, and you see that one after the other. There would be a judge, he would lead his people back to God, they would get set free from their enemies, and then after the judge died, they'd go back, and they'd repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, kind of like a wheel just spinning in a rut. That's the history of Israel. Then they thought, okay, let's get a king. Maybe if we had a king like all the other nations have, it would go better for us. It was the same thing. They had some good kings who led them back to the Lord, but most of the kings of Israel and Judah were bad, most of them. But what makes it possible for us to avoid making the same mistake, because let's not be so proud as to imagine that, oh, that was the people of Israel. We won't make the same mistake. We're bound to repeat that same mistake ourselves. What makes it possible for us to not make the same mistake is one thing and one thing only, and that is grace. Titus chapter 2, we read this verse, because we read, first of all, in um, um, John chapter 1. Keep a finger there in Titus chapter 1, or Titus 2, but let's look at this verse in John chapter 1 very quickly. What makes it possible? What is the only way by which I can be sure that I won't make the same mistake that all those people in the history of Israel, who some of them were good people. I mean, think of Asa. He was a good king, but he ended badly. Jehoshaphat, another good king who made mistakes in his life. David, look at how he fell. And he was a man after God's own heart. And who am I here to think that, oh, yeah, I wouldn't make the same mistake David did. So what is it that makes it possible for us to not make the same mistakes, to actually learn the lesson? And that is grace. And we read this in uh, John chapter 1, verse 14. Or let's just read verse 17. The law was given through Moses. So as long as you were under the law that was given through Moses, that's all you had. And then Jesus Christ came. And there's a reason that I, today in 2022, not speaking arrogantly or proudly, but just with humility and utter gratefulness to God, can say with absolute certainty, I will not make the same mistake that all those people in the Old Testament made. Not even John the Baptist, who was the greatest of them all. You read about some of the mistakes he made towards the end of his life in relationship to Jesus, as godly as he was. And so we must be able to say with absolute certainty, I'm not going to make that same mistake. And it's not presumptuous. Presumptuous means, okay, well, yeah, I'm self-confident that I'm not going to do it because this or that, or I have a godly home, or I go to RLCF, or anything like that. No, it is only because of grace. Because the law was given through Moses, and as long as I was still following the Moses tree, the Moses train, I was bound to make the same mistake. And if you were bad like Ahab, you would make that mistake. And if you were at the opposite end of the spectrum of kings like David, you would still make the same mistake. And the only difference was grace. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. And it's only because Jesus Christ has made grace available to him. That's the other part of him being an emancipator, one who makes free. He's given us grace. Now, what does the grace actually do for us? I wanted us to see that before I move on. And that's the verse in Titus chapter 2, verse 11. How do you know that you have the grace of God in your life? A lot of people say grace. You know, it's a common phrase to say, let's say grace before the meal. It's a false use of that word. <laughs> you can't say grace. God has to say grace. He has to give you grace if you, have, if you are humble, but just saying grace is not going to mean that you have grace. You pray, you bless the food like Jesus did. It's not saying grace, it's just blessing the food. Grace is something you can only get from God. You can't imagine it, you can't work it up. God has to give it to you. But here's how you will know that you actually have grace. You can't simply say, well, I'm a new covenant believer. I, I'm under you know, Jesus Christ has saved me by his blood, so therefore I have grace. No. Let's test our hearts. Let's test our lives to see whether we actually are under grace. And he says here, you will know that you have the grace of God. 
For the grace of God has come. You can say the grace of God is there. You know, let's say you're expecting a visitor. Maybe um, somebody's coming to visit you for the holidays. And you're looking out or coming to visit. They're coming over for dinner or something like that. And you're looking out the window. Are they here yet? Are they here yet? No, they haven't. No sign of them. And then all of a sudden, one of the kids shouts, oh, they're here. They've arrived. Because you see the car pulling up the driveway or something like that. How will you know the grace of God has come into your life and into your marriage and into your home? The grace of God has come bringing salvation to all. And this is the mark of that salvation. Instructing us to say no to ungodliness. Instructing us to say no to ungodliness. This is, one, this is the mark I've come to see. That this is the mark that you actually have grace. When you're under grace, you have a voice and a power within you to say no to ungodliness. That means whenever there's a situation of temptation, something comes your way, some opportunity to please yourself, to please your flesh, like David faced when he saw beautiful Bathsheba in the distance, like um, uh, Gehazi uh, uh, faced when he had that temptation to grab money. He was the servant of Elisha. And like all those other people who fell into sin, like Cain, when he, saw, when he was jealous of his brother and that jealousy was eating at him and eating at him and eating at him and God warned him and said, sin is there, it's crouching at the door, it's desires for you, it's going to destroy your life, Cain. And he didn't listen and he ended, ended up killing his brother and destroying his life. So today, what we have different is not, oh, the blood of Jesus Christ has forgiven me. No, that, they had the blood of bulls and goats that forgave them of their sins back then. It is the grace of God that is now available to me that instructs me. So that's instruction, first of all. That means in that situation where I'm facing a temptation, I hear a voice that says, no. Maybe there's a, a woman walking by and you as a man are tempted to lust. And you'll hear a little voice saying, turn away. Don't, don't look. Or something, some a commercial flops, comes up on, this, on the TV or on your computer. Or you're in a restaurant and this commercial comes up. And you'll hear a voice. That's the first mark that there's the grace of God in your life. You hear a little voice saying, no, don't look. Shield your eyes. Now, with our children, we have to teach them that because maybe the grace of God has not yet come into our lives. So if you've been around our children, I'm probably your children are raised the same way. When we're somewhere and there's a, something that's, that's tempting to them, we say, close your eyes, turn away. So we have to teach them that. But our goal is that eventually they'll come under grace well, they don't need daddy and mommy anymore. Because what's going to happen to our children, parents, when they're 18? And when they're 25? And 35? And daddy and mommy are no longer there to tell them, hey, don't look at that. That'll destroy your life. It'll destroy your marriage. It'll destroy your home. Daddy and mommy are not there anymore. They're grandparents now, and I'm an adult. It is the grace of God that instructs me to say no. <clears throat> now, my Bible says to deny ungodliness. But I remember when I was a young teenager and tempted in many different ways, uh, I heard a brother read this verse from a different translation that I'd never heard before. I think it's the NIV that reads this way, instructing us to say no. I love that. It, 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 um, it helped me understand what deny really means. Because deny could be a little bit of a <clears throat> big word, a complicated word. Deny ungodliness, okay, I don't really know what that means, so I just ignore it, move on. And I miss the reality of what deny really means. And so, children, I hope you, you'll listen to this part at least. This is essentially what the grace of God can do in your life. When you're tempted to do anything that you know is wrong, the grace of God will say, don't do that. Don't, don't strike back. I know they stole that toy from you, but don't, don't fight, don't do that. As much as you have that urge to fight back, don't do that. You'll hear a little voice in your heart and oh, that you will come to know this grace that comes through Jesus Christ. A little voice saying, don't do that, don't do that. And what you'll find is that even though that voice is there, sometimes it's so difficult, it's just so easy to just give in. But the grace of God also gives you power. There's another verse that says, God is at work in you both to will 
That means he's at work in you to, to not, I don't want to. I, don't want, I used to want to do that, but now I don't want to. In a situation, let's talk about married couples. You'll, you'll face a situation, you'll face situations where you're both arguing about something and you feel like your will is crossed by your husband or your wife and she doesn't see it your way, he doesn't see it your way and there's this conflict and then you know it starts to build and you're starting to say things that are hurtful and you're bringing up the past and through all of that you'll find a little voice in you saying, no, don't, don't go there, don't go there, it's not going to be worth it. And haven't we all gone down there and realized, man, I should have listened to that voice. <laughs> it's like Cain. I'm sure after he killed Abel, he thought, man, God warned me. In his case, it got so bad that he had to be banished. And it was horrible what Cain ended up in. I, he's in hell today. The reason I know that is because Jude warns us about him. I don't think Jude would warn us about him if he had turned around. And it's, think about what a different story Cain would have had. If that little voice that God was, God is faithful. See, God will always warn you. God will always warn us. And if he had just heeded to that voice, I think of Cain coming to this crossroad, crucial crossroad. It was in his thoughts. Nobody knew it. Abel didn't know it. Adam didn't know it. Eve didn't know it. It was just between Cain and God. And God was telling him, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. I see where you're going, Cain. Don't do that. And he just, well, he just gave in, gave in, gave in. And in that situation, I don't know if it was available to Cain. I believe it was because God will not allow even them to be tempted beyond whatever ability they had. If Cain had listened to the voice of God, the story would have been completely different. And that's a message of hope for us today, especially for those of us who are under grace. When you hear that little voice, oh, be careful to treasure it. Be careful to listen to it. It's a little, little voice. It's a little voice because he's not going to pound his fist at you. He's not going to grab you and push you aside from making that wrong decision. He wants you to love him. And so that's why he starts with a little voice, but it's the grace of God that will instruct you, instruct you, say no to God, ungodliness. But I was saying how I heard this verse in that translation and it changed my life. That moment, I can still almost picture where I was sitting, um, hearing that, that brother read from that paraphrase and um, and it, it was so good. It's just, I, I, it became an anchor for me at that moment. It says, Santosh, the Lord is telling me, I'll give you a voice that says, say no. And when you hear that voice, just cry out to me in that moment of temptation. Cry out to me, I'll help you. And if you're willing to listen to this voice, I'll, 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 I'll show you a way. I shared that video of that penguin that got isolated from the rest of his family because it thought, I can handle it. And God stuck, and yet even for that penguin, God says, I've got a plan for you. I'll, I'll get you out. I'll get you back. Listen, but next time, don't do it again. <laughs> don't go down there again. So I wanted us to see that verse. But the difference between what God did in setting the Israelites free from Egypt, from the Egyptians, and what he did for them when they entered into the promised land, this was their destination that they would enter in the promised land. The first thing I want you to see um, is in Exodus chapter 14. The journey of God destroying the Egyptians. God destroying the Egyptians. The journey of God destroying the Egyptians was momentary. Momentary. This is what I want you to remember. And the Egyptians are a picture of God dealing with our sin, the forgiveness from our sin, setting us free from all shame, all guilt, all um, um, condemnation, all discouragement over that, over our past sin. That happens in a moment. And I want you to see that. You'll see that the journey of the people of Israel going into the promised land and even in the promised land, which is the book of Joshua and Judges, is a long process. It's 40 years and some. 40 years just to enter the land of Canaan. And then whatever number of years, I don't remember, I don't know if it's told us, but it was quite a few years after that before they actually had peace. The length of Joshua's life, which was, I don't know, maybe 40 years, another 40 years. Maybe he was 70, I think, when he led the people of Israel into the land of Canaan, and he died at 110, so another 40 years. But the 
journey of God dealing with the past, the shame and the guilt and the forgiveness of the sins was instantaneous. It's one verse. And that's what I want you to see. Exodus chapter 14, verse 28. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, even Pharaoh's entire army that had gone into the sea after the Israelites. Not even one of them remained. One verse. And from the Israelites' perspective, it was instantaneous. I remember seeing a, a, a children's movie, I think, of telling the story of the Israelites' uh, uh, exodus from Egypt. And even in that cartoon, the, the Red Sea rushing back over the, the Egyptians was a, an awesome thing. Like the music's loud and the waves are crashing over. I don't even think that comes close. And I think many other movies have tried to recreate what that must have been like. But that's just recreations. The actual event was fantastic. I mean, you see, imagine the Israelites washing this wall of water coming at them. And these things happened to us as an example, happened to them as an example for us. And I imagine one of the Israelites looking over there, there comes that former taskmaster of mine who used to beat me every day. I'd go to work and he'd beat me and beat me and I still have the marks on my back that I remember from that one. There is, he is coming after me again. And this is the memory of the sins we've committed in the past that we've confessed, repented of, been justified from. Justified, as you've heard often in this church, means just as if I'd never sinned. And there's the devil saying, hey, I remember that you did that. There's the devil coming at us and trying to bring back the memory of it. I remember it and I see him coming at me. And that's when I need to remember this picture of the wall of sea that in an instant destroyed everything from my past. Every single bit of my sin, not just the past, the present and the future, is already dealt with. Now, how is it possible that in a moment where I confess, think, think about it for a moment, because th this is what the devil will do to you. I know that because he did that to me for many years. I would confess a sin. I'd repent of it. I would be genuine in my confession of it. And then the devil would come at me. And he'd say, ah, I remember. I know. And he would do that sometimes while I'd be sitting up here preaching or standing preaching. And he'd bring the memory of something that was long forsaken, dealt with, confessed, it's in the past. And I can't tell you how many times that's happened where I'd, I'd be preaching and the devil would, I mean, oh, he likes to come in those moments when God wants to use us. And he'd bring the memory of that. And in, while I'm speaking, I would have to say, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Bind your work in the name of Jesus. Jesus has already dealt with that. How much more when we're going through our everyday lives and God wants us to be effective husbands and fathers and mothers and wives, effective brothers thinking of the needs of others. And, um, and so, how is it, I was thinking, how is it that it's possible that in a moment, I, how is it that's, that it's possible that I have the right, as a child of God, that in a moment, my sin can be completely dealt with? Let's say you sinned a few minutes ago. Nobody even knew it. You thought some sinful thought, bitterness, unforgiveness, uh, lust, anger, whatever it might be. You just sinned and you were immediately convicted of it. And you say, oh Lord Jesus, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Do you know that in that instant it's done? That wave has just come and washed over that sin and it's done never again to come back up. How is it possible that I have the right that in an instant such a horrible thing that I've done is completely dealt with? It's because the eternal punishment of it has already been completed in Jesus Christ. That sin, that even if it was a one second sin, deserves an eternal punishment. It does. No matter how little you think it is or how big it is, maybe it's not as bad as a sin in your eyes, but it deserves an eternal punishment. And yet I'm entitled to instantaneous resolution. Problem solved in the moment. Why? Because Jesus suffered the entire Penalty, like we've been singing in that song. Jesus paid it all. Since it's already been paid, you don't have to spend a week repaying it because you'll never be able to repay it. I mean, you think a week is enough to pay back for one second 
of a lustful thought. Oh no, it's eternity in hell. That's how long it'll take to pay back the punishment for that one second of evil thought. But Jesus paid it all. And so in this moment, I can be completely set free. I, I tell you, I, it might seem basic, it might seem fundamental, but I, I have a burden because I know growing up in a church where we heard I heard teachings that taught about victory over sin and forgiveness and all that. The devil still plagued me for years. And I thought, well, you know, that was really bad. I guess God must expect me to sit in a corner for about a week or so. And he's not going to look at me. And he's kind of just going to be like, Santos, you've got to sit in the corner. What you did was really bad. So just don't come near me for a week. Is that the God you know? That you know that he's, you've grieved him? You know how, uh, how, how grievous sin is to him. And because we preach a high standard of sin, which we will always preach, it's easy for us to start to think, well, God, you're so holy. And I, I, I feel so bad about that sin. I imagine how you must feel about it. Sure, Lord, I'll sit in a corner for a week or two weeks or whatever and just kind of mope there. And, and after that, can we come back? That is a lie from the devil. You don't have to sit for a week. No, no. <laughs> Because in an instant, in an instant, it's washed away. The flood, I mean, what do you imagine? That it was a little trickle of the Red Sea coming and little by little these, these uh, Egyptians are getting weaker and weaker and slowly. No, it was in a moment. One verse. Exodus 14, verse 28. One verse. It was in an instant. They had no chance. Remember that. The problem after that was that that was not the destination for the people of Israel. God had promised them. He, he said, I've already dealt with your, your past. 430 years of captivity gone in a moment. You know, 430 years. I don't think any of us, well, I know none of us is ever going to live for 430 years. But to me, that's a wonderful Example, even that is an example that God allowed that captivity. You know, don't you think God loved his people so much that he thought, man, let it just be 20 years or five years, one year? Why did it have to be 430 years? I don't know, but this is what I take from that because 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6 is true even for me today that that 430 years happened to them as an example for me. And I'll, I'll tell you what this has really done for me personally, and that is, I picture that 430 years like the longest I've ever been defeated in a sin. I, I'm never going to come close to 430 years. Maybe it's 20 years. Maybe it's a long period of time, but for you it feels like forever that that sin has been besetting you and besetting you and besetting you. And God says, I'll instantaneously cl cleanse you from that sin, no matter how long you've been in that sin. Maybe you've been an alcoholic for 20 years and the, and the world says, there's not much hope for you. Your liver's gone and, uh, and God says, I can forgive that. The greatest example of this for me is the thief on the cross who had done everything wrong in his life. And there he was and he, his, his, his hands are nailed to the cross. He can't even, he doesn't have the chance to go back to his mom and say, mom, I'm so sorry. I'm sure you had hopes that I would be a much better kid and here I am. The mockery of the entire nation hung up there. I'm sure he, at that moment, he thought, man, I, I've killed so many people. I wish I could go to any one of them, even just one of them, and say, I'm so sorry I killed your father. I'm so sorry I did that to you. I, he doesn't even have the opportunity to do that. He's got a few seconds left. The breath is fading out of his lungs as he's hanging there on the cross. And almost with his dying breath, he says, he looks at Jesus and says, is there hope for me? I've got one second left. Jesus says, all I need is one second <laughs> because I'm paying the penalty. At that point, I believe Jesus had already finished the suffering maybe. If I remember correctly, Jesus had finished that three hours of suffering, which was an eternity in, in, in suffering my punishment. And then this thief on the cross says, I have one second to give you, Lord. And he says, that's good enough. Today you will beat me in paradise. See, that's the, power of a moment, the instantaneous power of the forgiveness of God. The problem with the people of Israel, though, is that the journey wasn't supposed to end there. 
They were supposed to go into the promised land and the promise was a land flowing with milk and honey. Not just, you know, God didn't tell them. If you read in the, in the promise that he, when Moses came, when Moses and Aaron came to the people of, the leaders of the people of Israel, before all of this happened, even before the plagues, the promise was not, hey, the Red Sea is going to wash over all your enemies. That was not even mentioned. That was just a part of the journey to what was actually promised. What was promised? Go back and read it. It was God has set aside for you a land flowing with milk and honey. What happens along the way? You leave that up to the Lord. How will he solve the problem of the Egyptians? Okay, he'll take care of it. What about food in the wilderness? Well, he'll do it. Water when there's bitter water and there's no water in the desert. He'll take care of it. He said he would take you into a land flowing with milk and honey. That was the promise. What is that for us today? You know that. Our destination, Romans chapter 8. We must know this. We use this verse often in our church, but probably not often enough. Let's turn to that verse, Romans chapter 8, so we know where it is. This is the land flowing with milk and honey. It's not that my past is forgiven. That's not the land flowing with milk and honey. The, what happened to the, the Israelites is written to us for an example. And like I said, it would be a tragedy if I get to heaven and say, well, Lord, I learned the lesson that you wanted the Egyptians to uh, be swept away. You wanted my past to be forgiven. And God will say, you didn't read your Bible. That was not the promise. That was not the promise. The promise is this, Romans 8, 29 those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. Sorry, I'm reading verse 30. Um, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. He said, this is the promise. This is your destination. To become conformed to the image of his son. So that Jesus, let me paraphrase the rest of that verse, would have a bunch of younger brothers and sisters that look just like him in their nature so that he might become the firstborn among many brethren. So there would be a little brother of Jesus says, they look at him and say, hey, you look like Jesus. Are you related to him? Not physically, in nature. Well, one day you'll, you'll come back from work and, and your wife will say, hey, you're speaking to me a little bit differently today. What happened? You sound a little bit like Jesus, <laughs> quite different from yesterday <laughs> when you came back. Did you have a good day? And then you'll tell your wife, no, honey, this was a worse day than yesterday. But I've seen Jesus, the great emancipator, the one who sets free. And I, he, by his grace, I'm a little bit more like him today. And I want to become a little bit more like him tomorrow. This is grace. This is our destination. To be conformed into the image of his son. So that Jesus would have a bunch of younger brothers and sisters that look just like him. Now, this is a little bit fresh in our mind because we've got puppies. But it's really neat and the kids are really good at this because they can say, Oh, that little thing he does, that little puppy does, reminds us of one of the parents, Shasta or Denali. Or, oh, this, 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 this feature on his face looks just like the dad or the mom. And I, I, when I see that, I think, man, that's what God wants to do for me. That little by little, people who know me and get to know me a little bit more will say, you're actually starting to look a little bit like Jesus, you know, in your nature. And you, you know, we don't live for the approval of people. We're not waiting for people to do that. But think about it like this, that one day you'll have a tremendously trying day homeschooling the kids, let's say. And then the chore is piled up and then the dishes are piled up in the sink and the, the floor is a mess and the laundry is uh, overflowing and then the kids are, one of them is sick on top of it. And you'll find patience, the fruit of the Spirit, which is the nature of Christ in that situation where it beats all imagination or any explanation why you would be patient in that situation. And you'll, you'll just sit back on, on, on the floor, maybe collapsing in tiredness and just say, but Lord, you're going to give me patience. You're not done with me. And my destination is to be conformed into the image of Jesus. And if Jesus, who was never impatient even for a moment in his life, is the one into whose image you're conforming me, then you're going to do that for me, Lord. And I'm going to lay a hold of you. I'm going to let you lay a hold of me until I am fully conformed into the image of Jesus. 
This was the destination that God had made for the Israelites. Unfortunately, let's turn to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. These things happen to us as an example. Happen to them as an example. I keep misstating it. These things happen to them as an example for us. These things happen to them as an example for us. Numbers 13 happened to them as an example for us. And you get to Numbers 13 and you see here that, very interesting, I just want you to see, you know the whole story, right? These spies went and they've, they've, they've spent two years walking through the wilderness and all oh, God has taken care of them. Every time they faced a problem, they complained. And every time they complained, God still solved the problem for them. And here, two years later, listen, God has not yet given up on them. They are still able to go into the promised land. God is still willing to fulfill the promise for them. It's been two years, but this is the final test. This is the final test for these Israelites. You know the history. They failed that test, and God said, okay, sorry, you can't, you can't go into the promised land. And every single one of those adults, their two years, two years, I mean, just think, all they had to do was think back, Lord, here I am facing these giants. And this is what I want you to see also. The giants are a picture of our lusts, the lust in our flesh. And it's very easy for us to mistake the giants for our past, our past sins. And when you're facing a temptation where you're battling this sin now, maybe it's a sin that you wrestled with in the past, or maybe it's a brand new sin. Remember, the, the Canaanites are not the Egyptians. Now, it might seem simple, but let, let me talk about that for a moment. The Canaanites are not the Egyptians. The Egyptians were done with. Not, it was not the Egyptians who came back into the land of Canaan. It was a completely different people. It was the Canaanites that God had there for a reason. And so, when you're in your battle against sin, what is the spiritual principle for us now? When you say, okay, well, Santosh, the, yeah, the Canaanites are not the Egyptians. But what does that mean? It means that in that moment, for me, it means that in that, thank you, <laughs> you guys love me so much. <laughs> in that moment, when I'm facing this giant, the devil will be quick to tell me, see, God didn't actually forgive you. Has he done that for you? Oh, he's done that for me. The devil will come and see. I thought you said all, what was all this justification business? Look at you, you're still defeating the same sin. And that moment, I tell you, it has been such a tremendous encouragement for me to know this is not my past that I'm battling with. This is a giant. The past is dealt with. Sin has already been forgiven, cleansed. I'm justified. And here I am in the middle of this battle, in this temptation. But it doesn't change the fact that I'm forgiven and I'm justified. And there's no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, even those of us who are in the middle of the battle. And I imagine... Well, let's, let's not get too far ahead. But here were these people, and I want you to see in verse 27, in Numbers 13, verse 27, these 12 people went there into the land of Canaan, and they came back, and they said, Moses was right. We actually saw the milk and the honey. All 12 of them said that. <laughs> you see that? Thus they told him, they, all 12 of them, and said, we went into the land where you sent us, <coughs> And it certainly does flow with milk and honey. God was right. The promise that he gave us all the way back those two years ago before we left Egypt, he was absolutely right. Moses said it was a milk and honey. We didn't see any evidence of it for two years, but here we are. We went into it and he was right. In fact, this is its fruit. You know, what, what do you think they brought back fruit? I don't know, some grapes or something like that. Can you imagine that fruit, how much each of the Israelites would have got? You know, there was 600,000 men, it says. You double that for the number of women, so that's 1.2 million. Plus you add the children on top of that. Two, three million maybe, if you do the math. At least three million, I would say. And maybe each of them says, hey, you get one little piece of this grape. <laughs> This is just a little taste that there's such a thing as a land of flowing with milk and honey. You can't quite see it over here, but if we cross over there, you'll do it. But nevertheless, sad words in verse 28, nevertheless. Oh, if they had just 
said that if they if the story had ended in verse 27 what a different story it would have been these things happen to them as an example for us i hope there will not be a nevertheless in your life brother sister no matter what whether it's been two years or 40 years or whatever the 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 trial and the journey that you've been through with the lord let it not be a nevertheless yeah i saw the milk and honey I, I, I got a little bit of a taste of it, but I saw some giants. Sad, sad. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Amalek is living in the land of the Negev and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites are living in the hill country and the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of Jordan. And you know the rest of that story. They didn't believe God and God said okay go ahead and they, and, and they were condemned to a life uh, that they, they perished in the in the desert that's what we, re- we saw in first Corinthians 10 God was displeased with them think about with all the mistakes that made all the mistakes they made all they needed to do was say Lord I know I've messed up so many times oh I wish I could redo the last two years so differently from how I've done it but here I am you've still brought me to the edge of the land of Canaan Haven't you thought that's amazing that despite all their disobedience and their repeated grumbling and complaining and Korah and and all those people died and and yet here's a remnant of people God saying, I've still brought you to the land of Canaan. And they said, ah, no, we saw the giants. And then, you know, God took them into the land of Canaan and and, um, after they wandered for 38 years and 38 years later, the children, the descendants got to go into the land of Canaan. And what was that like? You know, you read um, in, in the book of Joshua. Let's go over to the book of Joshua. and Look at what their journey was like. This journey was different. It wasn't an instantaneous wiping away of the, of the giants. Was, there, was God not powerful enough to send some other flood to wipe away the giants like he did with the, with the Egyptians in the Red Sea? Oh, he could have but he was trying to teach them something else. These things happen to them as an example for us. Because God does not deal with the lusts in our flesh in a moment. He deals with our sin in a moment, gone forever, justified. But the lusts in our flesh, he is allowed to remain. We sang that song yesterday in the Global Online meeting. I asked the Lord for grace, and then he gave me a trial. He gave me a test to strengthen me. And so these people um, had to go into the land of Canaan and fight these giants by the grace of God, by the power of God. God would still help them, but they had to fight it. And that's why I started with looking at that verse in Titus chapter 2, that it's the grace of God that has come now for us, instructing us to say no. So when you're facing that giant, when you're facing that temptation, remember God has brought you into the land of Canaan. He's dealt with your past. You don't have to second guess whether he's actually forgiven you. He's got a plan for your life. Now, cry out to him for grace. Cry out to him for grace. He'll give you grace. And we see that over and over again. And here's a thought that I had, which has really blessed me even in my battle against sin. And that is this, that let's say the, Egyptian, the, the Israelites faced one of the Canaanite or, or the, uh, you know, the Amalek, Amalekite giants. And uh, they're fighting against him, and they're fighting, and then they get beaten down. In the middle of that battle, while they were in the land of Canaan, guess what else was there? Milk and honey. Even in the midst of those battles, I believe that somewhere in that land, because they were in the land that was flowing with milk and honey, and as they were possessing it, I know with all my heart, I believe that God allowed them to taste milk and honey along the journey. He didn't say, listen, you've got to get complete victory over all sin. You've got to defeat all the giants. And then I'll let you have the milk and honey. No, the land was flowing with milk and honey. What is, the, what is the lesson for us? These things happen to them as an example for us. Um, look at this verse with me in 2 Timothy chapter 2. It's a verse that's really helped me often in times of temptation. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Very easy to remember. Children, you can remember this verse because you'll need it one day. I've needed it so many times. 2 Timothy 2.22. 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. Very easy to remember. 2 Timothy 2.22. He says, flee from youthful lust. Now he's writing to a 
40-year-old Timothy. <laughs> He's not writing to 18-year-old Timothy. Timothy's about 40 years old when Paul's writing this. He says, listen, I know you're 40 years old. You still have to flee. It's true with sexual lust. It's true with anger. It's true with bitterness, jealousy, gossip, uh, unforgiveness towards others. Uh, all of these things, condemnation, discouragement, flee it. Flee from youthfulness. But, and so he says, when you, when you, what does it mean then to fight against the giant? What does it mean to fight against the giant? It means to flee. Remember this, dear brothers and sisters. In that moment, to fight and win is to flee. Not flee from the devil. When the devil attacks you, you attack him back. He's the one who flees from you. Like we sing, in the name of Jesus, Satan will have to flee. He will have to flee. He does flee every time we rebuke him and resist him in the name of Jesus. Resist the devil and he will flee from you, we're told in James 4. Yes, he will. But what should you do when you're facing temptation? You must flee. That means when you know that this situation you're about to go into is likely to lead you into sin, run away from it. Flee. When you're in that situation where maybe you're discussing with your wife or your husband and, and there's some, you'd sense this is going in the wrong direction, what should you do? Even if you don't have time to explain to your wife what you're about to do, get in the truck and drive away. Or something. And I'm not saying run away. Maybe just send her a text, honey, listen, I was just about to go down the path of sin like I always do with you, but I'm trying to flee in this situation. <laughs> what a different story. Flee. But in the midst of that fleeing, while you're that's, that's what it means to battle the giant. You're fleeing from that lust. You're running away. Men, if you're in a workplace where you're tempted with somebody in the workplace that, that likes to flirt or somebody that, that sends you a message here and there and you sense this is not, flee. Or somebody wants to come over to your house and gossip. Flee, don't answer the door <laughs> if you know why they're coming to your house. Or they're, they call you up or they send you this text, this, you, you, gossipy, juicy details. Flee. But while you're fleeing, this is the part I want you to see, pursue righteousness. Right next to that giant is a little pile of milk and honey that God wants you to dig into. Pursue Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus. Right there, it's right there. Oh, if you will take your eye off of that giant for a moment and look to Jesus. Look to him. Take out his word and say, Lord, I've done this so many times, brothers. I, I hope, I, you know, I'm trying to show you verses in God's word because that's where it must begin. But this is working in my life. I, God is my witness. I wouldn't lie to you. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I just... I hope that you too will have hope and faith that right in the midst of that temptation, whatever it is, maybe you're in the workplace and, and you're being harassed in some way, the devil's oppressing you with some thought, right there next to you, look over to the other side, there's righteousness, pursue that. Flee youthful lust, pursue righteousness, pursue faith, pursue love, pursue peace. And remember, he says in the midst of all of this, there's another brother of yours over there in his house or in his workplace who's also doing the same thing with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Isn't it wonderful to know? That's why we share in our struggles. We encourage each other daily because I like to think that one of you brothers or one of you sisters or one of you children, while I'm in the middle of that temptation, one of my brothers is also going through the same thing. And they're looking for the honey. They're looking for the milk that's right there next to that giant. What a comfort. And in the midst of those battles, if they had seen the milk and honey, they could, it would have been quite a different story. You know, it says in uh, Psalm 34, verse 8, what does it say? Taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, I've, I was thinking about this. A taste is a little bit different from all the other senses that we have. We have the sense of touch, the sense of sight, smell, hearing, um, Taste is a little bit different. In order for you to experience the tense of taste, you actually have to take it into your body. Right? I can touch this. doesn't have to enter my body. Smell it. doesn't have to. That thing that I'm smelling doesn't have to go in, thankfully. Uh, hearing, seeing. But taste, you actually, if I want to taste an apple, I can't just sit there and, you know, drool over it or imagine what it tastes like. I actually have to put it in. And this is what it means when it says taste and see. I've been trying to Ask the Lord, Lord, I want to taste and see that you're good. Not just hear and know that the Lord is good. Look and see that the Lord is good. T 
touch and see, you know, the disciples. So have you thought that wouldn't it have been wonderful if I could have been like John leaning my head on, on Jesus' shoulder? No. That's not what set John free from sin. Because Judas was sitting there, shook the same hand of Jesus, and he betrayed Jesus. But tasting. That means I deny myself. I take up my cross and say, Lord Jesus, I want to taste your life. Have you tasted the life of Jesus? I'm not trying to be metaphysical or, or anything like that. I'm just saying that there's a reality of receiving, receiving, receiving in me the life of Christ, which is the only way that I can know that the Lord is good, is if I've received his life within me. Otherwise, oh Lord, thank you. Great is your faithfulness. I woke up. You know, most Christians' prayers are like this. I, I, I woke up this morning and I didn't die in the middle of the night. There's enough food to eat in the fridge. There's, I have good health and all these things. But I'm, I want to pray the prayer that says, Thank you, Lord, that I tasted you last night. I'm tasting you this morning. I'm seeing the milk. I'm, I'm tasting the honey. And yes, the giant's still there. And he's been there for 10 years. And I don't know when. But Lord, he is going to come crashing down one of these days. Because I'm living for the milk and honey. Bear with me, if you will. Joshua chapter 6. Let's look just for a few minutes at what it was like for these Israelites in the land flowing with milk and honey. You know, even David wrote, um, your law is like honey, even sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. For him, it was just the law. Is that, you know, have you thought, is it just that you read the Bible and it's, it's honey in the honeycomb? No, no. <laughs> Yeah, it's good. You know, sometimes it's bitter and all that. But I'll tell you what makes this book honey for me is Jesus. <laughs> Otherwise, you could read the Bible and it's just like, oh, I didn't get anything out of it. Oh, this book changed for me when I started to see Jesus written. Not just written. Where the words that I read, I said, Lord, I want to take a bite out of this scripture I'm about to read. This memory verse, I want to take a bite out of it. I don't want to just read it, hear it, see it. Memorize it. No, I want to taste it, Lord. Make this verse that I've been meditating on this week real inside of me. That's why we want to memorize it. That's the purpose of the memorization. And say, you make it your prayer. Lord, I want to taste this verse. Our verse for this week. What is it? I've already forgotten. Anybody remember? Proverbs 4.23, right? Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Let's make it our goal, brothers and sisters, this week that we'll taste that verse. Not just say it, not just think about it, taste it. Say, Lord, what does it mean to watch over my heart? How did Jesus watch over his heart with all diligence so that everything that came out of him was purity, was love, was joy, was peace, was patience, was self-control, kindness, goodness, faithfulness? Let the word become flesh in me like it was for Jesus, the word become flesh. For David, it was only words. Thy law I love, it's sweeter than, sweet, than the honeycomb. For me, it's so much different. This is what it means to be in the new covenant. Jesus is sweeter, even sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. The law, uh, it brings death. I could interpret scripture and recite scripture and teach scripture, but the letter kills. The spirit of Jesus Christ is what gives life. You see in Joshua chapter 6 that they came to Jericho. You know the story, so I don't have to give you the details, but I just want to point out a few things. First of all, they come to Jericho and God deals with them. First time they battle this, this city, they win. They circle around the city. If I did do the math right, 13 times, I think. Six times, on the one time each for the first six days, and then seven times on day seven. And then they blew the trumpets and the walls came crashing down. And, then, and this was a fortress. I mean, it says that the walls were thick and they, they couldn't penetrate that. Jericho's stronghold was its walls. And God laughs in the face of that stronghold. And you might think about this lust that has wreaked havoc in your life. That stronghold in your life that's been there for years. And God says, I'll deal with it. You trust me. And they destroy Jericho. But then you keep reading. You go over to chapter 7. Um, and... Um, we read the end of Joshua chapter 6, verse 27. They've destroyed Jericho, and then something interesting happens. We read in chapter 7, verse 4. 
They went up to the next city. So they've, they've destroyed that first giant. God has brought me to a life of victory in, in this area. Now I'm moving on to the next one. And they went about 3,000, verse 4, Joshua, uh, Joshua 7, verse 4. About 3,000 men from the people went up there and they fled from the men of Ai. What happened here? The men of Ai struck down about 36 of their men and pursued them from the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them down on the descent. And here they thought, well, we're going to just coast through this Christian life because look, our first victory was easy. Something had happened. They forgot that the reason they were able to destroy Jericho was because of the presence of God with them and they had lost the presence of God when they came to Ai. And this is why our cry, dear brothers and sisters, Lord, we crave your presence. Your, if your presence doesn't go with us, then I, I, I'm going to fail, Lord. I'm bound to have the worst week of my life that I've ever had unless your presence goes with me from this meeting place today. And what was it that caused them? First of all, you see, and Joshua he should have been a little bit smarter because the devil's a cunning enemy. He sees that you're a little bit confident with that victory you had last month and he's a He's got a nice little trap laid out for you this week. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, verse 2. Joshua 7, verse 2. And they said to them, go up and spy out the land. So the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, listen, ah, this is going to be a piece of cake. Do not let all the people go up. Only about two or 3,000 men is enough to go up to Ai. Don't make all the people toil up there, for they are, they are few will do this. There's a verse in Amos 6, I think it says, Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. Remember this, dear brothers and sisters, that it's after you've had a victory that you're perhaps in greater danger of falling deeper than you fell before. It's after you have, God brings you to a life of victory in a particular area that now you're perhaps in greater danger. See, before you came to Jericho, you were like, Lord, I, I can't do this. These are big giants. But then you defeated that giant and all of a sudden now you're like, ah, oh, yeah, let's take it easy. I really believe that for those of us, which is all of us living in, in the United States and in the Western world, it is we're in greater danger of living a life of ease of being those people about whom God says, woe to those. I would almost say, woe to those who live in America. Because it's a comfortable life we live. We, you know, some of us may have a few struggles here and there, but compared to some of the struggles that other people around the world face, it's nothing. We haven't seen poverty like exists in other parts of the world. Woe to those who are at ease. Woe to those who are at ease in the church, because they think, ah, yeah, I know that person, he's got that struggle. I hear about that other person, he's always asking me for prayer. But me, yeah, look at me, I'm a good Christian. Whoa, watch out. You're about to face AI. Yeah, we know about how, how you won in Jericho, but you're coming up on AI now. The other thing, so first of all, was that self-confidence, the woe to those that are ease. The other thing we see in verse one is that there was a secret sin represented by this man, Achan, he took some of the spoil and hid it. He says in verse 21, Joshua 7, verse 21. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight, then I coveted them and took them and behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my tent. And you might think I hid it. My wife doesn't know about it. My husband doesn't know about it. My children don't know about it. My brothers and sisters in Christ don't know about it. It's secretly hidden away. God says, that's going to be your downfall. You haven't obeyed me exactly. This is not talking about sin. It's talking about exactness with the commands of God. See, that's why we take every command in the new covenant seriously. A lot of people say, well, why do your sisters cover their head? It's because we take every command in the scripture seriously. Why do we value the gift of prophecy? It's because we take every command in the scripture seriously. Why do you speak about gossip? Was some, something that most churches never speak about. Because the Bible speaks about it. Why do you speak about lust? Because the Bible, Jesus spoke about it. He said you'd go to hell over it. Why do you speak about anger and bitterness and unforgiveness? Because we want to take the little commands seriously. And you might think it was a little... I mean, Achan didn't take a whole bunch. He, he, he knew exactly how much he took. Compared to the wealth of Jericho, it was very little. But it was a little command from a big God... And God saw it. He says, I know you kept it hidden, but you can't hide it from me. 
Beware of the sins that the devil will try to get you to conceal. You know this verse, Proverbs 28? Before we go there, let's just finish reading in in Joshua 7. Look at how they dealt with it. Now, the good news was that they dealt with the sin radically. Joshua chapter 7, verse 25, the middle of verse 25. This is the radical attitude that God wants from his people towards his commandments and disobedience to his commandments. The Lord, um, the middle of verse 25, all Israel stoned them with stones and they burned them with fire. I mean, after you've killed somebody by stoning him to death, you want to burn him on top of that? That's the radical attitude God is looking for. Burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that stands in to this day. And the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. And then you read chapter 8 verse 1. Now the Lord said, listen, don't fear, don't be discouraged. Let's go get AI. I love that. Instantly, the moment sin was dealt with radically. And you said, Lord, I will. You circumcise my heart to obey you. I'll obey you. And immediately God says, okay, AI is yours now. And you read the rest of the story. It's pretty interesting, children, if you want to read it sometime. They go to attack AI and the people in the AI think, oh, it's the same people who came yesterday, except 36 fewer of them whom we killed. And they think we're going to win. What they didn't know was God was with these people now. He wasn't with them last week when they came. But today they'd humbled themselves. Today they had dealt with secret sin. That verse that says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, oh, then I will heal their land. I will give them victory. I'll close with this verse. Proverbs 8, no, 28, verse 13. He who conceals his transgression will never prosper. Don't hide it. I'm not talking about bringing it out into the light and letting everybody know that you fell. No, there's a circle within which You can do it first of all. It must be before God. And that's where if you really come to faith, God can bring you to a life of victory if the sin is between, you know, it's within that circle. If you committed it against your wife or husband, you confess it there. But sometimes God will allow you to have brothers uh, who can help you in that that journey of having faith that God can really set you free. Um, But this wanting to conceal it, and where I, I'm trying to save my reputation and, and hide it, he who conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses it. Confesses it means you've got to call it by the worst possible name. If you lusted, you've got to say, I committed adultery. If you had a bitter thought or said a bitter word towards your husband or wife, you've got to call it murder. You say, I just murdered my wife. If you deal with it radically, you confess it. Call it by the ugliest name that God calls it. See that that's the reason why Jesus had to hang on the cross. He who confesses and forsakes it. That means run. The next time you face that, run. Do everything within your, change your schedule. Cancel that, that situation. Do this, do that. You know, um, uh, pray, seek God, prepare in advance for that trial. He who fors- confesses and forsakes his sin will find compassion. These things happen to us for an example. I, haven't, I keep saying it wrong. He, these things happen to them as an example for us. I hope we learn the lesson. Amen.